Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Emmy and I'm your host at the Graph Hair Club podcast. In today's episode, we are going to discover the life of Mickey. She is the Senior Engineering Manager at Edge and Node. I don't think you want to miss her story, right? So get ready and stay tuned in this video. Hello everyone, and it is very nice to introduce you today to Miki. She is from Edge Node, and she is an amazing woman that will tell her story about her journey in Web3. So hi Miki, how are you? Hi, I'm great. Thank you so much for having me here today. No problem. It is a pleasure for us to have you here. So maybe you can tell about a little bit about yourself, like what do you do, what is... Uh, Do you, what do you like and something that we can like get uh, to know about Mickey? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico in the United States. Um, recently, I've been getting into running. Uh, so for the last couple months, I've been following a running plan, ramping me up to run a 10K, uh, which I'll be doing soon. I also am an avid reader. So I read a lot of books. Um, usually over 150 books a year, and that's a mix of fiction, nonfiction. I kind of enjoy reading a little bit of everything. Um, I'm married. I have a dog. Hopefully he won't bark during this interview, <laughs> uh, but no promises. Okay, no problem. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's a little bit about me. That's very nice. I think that running is something that I want to do someday, but it requires a lot of mental strength. <laughs> so I congratulate you for that. <laughs> it's definitely teaching me about discipline and learning what I'm capable of and, and being able to run distances that I didn't think I could. <laughs> yeah, of course. So uh, now can you tell us a little bit about your journey in Web3? Like, how did you get into this and what was the journey like? like? Yeah, absolutely. So before I worked at Edge of Node, I spent 10 years at a government laboratory here in the United States. It was called Sandia National Laboratories. Uh, it's here in Albuquerque on the Kirtland Air Force Base. And I gained a ton of amazing experience there. It's a highly technical engineering laboratory. Um, if people aren't familiar with Sandia, it was actually born out of the Manhattan Project. So to this day, Sandia's main mission area is stewarding the U.S. nuclear weapons stockpile. So I spent about half of my career there working on nuclear weapon programs. Um, but the other kind of mission areas are core science and technology and also intelligence and counterintelligence. So the other half of my career there was spent on the counterterrorism sort of side of the house, where in that role, I was the skill set manager for uh, a, a kind of networking and classified communication device team. And so That was a really intense work environment, uh, really incredible uh, scientists and engineers working to defeat terrorists and, and uh, dismantle nuclear and radiological dispersal devices um, using pretty incredible technology. So really learned a lot in, in those experiences. I had also led a team there that was focused on building kind of a Web2 style indexer. Um, it was actually a web crawler that would crawl through document rep repositories, index data, and then we built a UI on top where engineers could query the data from those different repositories. We applied some machine learning algorithms. So that was a really cool experience to expose me to machine learning, indexing, um, scheme, different schemas, and a uh, really cool, cool experience. And during my time there, uh, several people who used to work at Sandia had come actually to the graph ecosystem. So I heard about it from a, a former colleague of mine, and, and that was my road into Edge of Node. Um, interviewed originally to be the engineering manager for the graph node team. And then about a year ago, um, uh, we did a reorg, and now I'm the senior engineering manager over our engineering operations team. So that's security engineering and site reliability engineering. And now I also manage the technical support team as well. Wow. So I believe that you had like a great journey also like going into Web3, but 
being now in Web3, I think it is amazing. Like you're in the graphic system, edge and node is like something very big. So I just want like to go and ask her or, or ask you as the leader of this technical support and engineering department, like could you provide some insights about into the responsibilities and challenges that are, so, that are associated with your role? And additionally, if you have encountered any specific difficulties or obstacles to your position as a woman in a leadership role? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, um, you know, since I manage people, I would say, um, you know, uh, so there's some kind of tactical challenges of, you know, you never have enough people to get all of the work done that you could ever want to do. Um, Edge and Node is, you know, the original creators of the graph and now one of the core developers of the graph protocol. And we are very ambitious and have our sights set high. And so as a people leader, people manager, you're often in this position where you have to set lofty goals and achieve amazing things, but you also have a limited set of resources available. So I would say a big challenge of being an engineering manager in general is finding that right balance between choosing the right, um, kind of on the strategic side, choosing the right focus areas or initiatives and collaborating across teams to define what those objectives should be. And then ensuring on the tactical side that your team members are equipped, um, they have the right tooling, the right skill set and knowledge uh, and direction to accomplish those goals. As a woman, um, <laughs> I would say, uh, you know, Edge and Node has a really amazing culture in general, and also within the engineering team. Um, I don't feel like I'm ever treated as a second class citizen for being a woman in my role. However, I am the only female engineering leader um, within the engineering organization. Uh, and also I have on my team, the only female engineer at Edge Node as well, and she's our security engineer. And so I think just in general, there are oftentimes, you know, things that I might notice or experience or issues that people might feel more comfortable raising to me because I am a woman um, that maybe our male counterparts are not always aware of. However, they are always super open to having those discussions. Anytime I bring up anything related to diversity and inclusion, they're incredible advocates and very interested in having those discussions with me. Okay. So I think that this level of inclusivity, uh, it's more like active in the web three ecosystem i don't know if do you think the same way like do you think that web three is like more inclusive and more diverse and like like giving women opportunities in in this ecosystem i definitely definitely think so so in my opinion oftentimes in my experience at least i have found that myself and many other women in engineering have followed a non-traditional pathway to get into engineering. That's not true in all cases. There are a lot of uh, women who are engineers who went through kind of what I call the more traditional route. They graduated high school, they got a bachelor's in engineering, they got a master's in engineering, and then became an engineer. But there are a lot of women who don't follow that pattern. Um, myself being one of them, I didn't. I did not follow <laughs> that that trajectory into my into my engineering roles. Um, and so I think what's interesting is in Web two. In my experience, just thinking of, you know, Sandia as one example of many, um, they have very rigid job requirements. So a job posting says you must have a master's degree in this exact discipline and this exact number of years of experience. And if you don't have those things, you will not be considered for a role. So oftentimes if women, you know, came from, let's say, a dis you know, disadvantaged background or let's say you're a woman who's a single mother, it will inherently take you longer to finish your degree Um, you'll be facing challenges that, you know, other people just have the privilege to not deal with. And so I felt like those rigid requirements in Web 2 weed out women um, by default, uh, because if they're, let's say, I'm a, you know, if someone's a single parent and they have a 2.9 GPA, for example, because they had to miss classes due to childcare issues, even though they're giving it their all and they would be a good engineer, a lot of Web2 companies would automatically weed them out because they don't meet the threshold for a job posting. And in Web3, in my experience, at least at Edge Node, I think this is true for a lot of other Web3 companies, there's so much more flexibility and fluidity around writing a job, posting, considering applicants who don't even meet what you wrote. You can have a more open mind and really 
um, interview candidates who come from all sorts of walks of life and backgrounds and, and view them for the whole person that they are. Oh, that's amazing. And can you share like any personal experiences or observations like regarding biases that women often face in these technical positions? Like if you like saw, have saw these things, how have you effectively navigate through them in your role at Itch and Node? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people who have these biases aren't aware of them. It's an unconscious bias and they come from, they might say something without being aware of how it would be received. And I think, um, I, you know, I experience this regularly just being in a technical environment at all. Like if I go to a conference um, or a gathering, I'm often asked if I'm there with my husband or if I'm in a clerical or administrative position. I think if I were a man walking into a technical conference, everyone would just assume I'm an engineer and that in my experience, I'm often assumed to not be in engineering uh, because of my gender. I will say, I think partnering with men is the key to success for inclusivity in the workplace. And we shouldn't feel like we have to shy away from having hard conversations and explaining our point of view. I think educating each other, making each other aware of our unconscious biases is the key to um, dismantling them. That's amazing. Like, I love how you are very confident with how you lead, like, this technical and engineering department and how you, like, don't mind about, like, being a woman here, you know? It's, like, something that comes very natural, and I really admire that because sometimes it can be very scary to be in this world, especially if you're an engineer or if you know how to code. So maybe you can tell us like a little bit about how, how have you personally overcome challenges and stereotypes to establish yourself in a leadership role? Like, do you have any lessons that you've learned along the way? Yeah, I would say, um, let's say you're wanting to get into an engineering position. You come from a non-technical background. That was the case for me. You will have to work harder to educate yourself. You will have knowledge gaps and don't. I would say main advice, don't feel sorry for yourself. Don't feel like it's going to make you a worse engineer and accept and acknowledge that you're going to have to work extra hard to get your skill set up to where it needs to be. Um, and that requires a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of long nights studying. Um, and I think just maintaining curiosity in that way will also serve you very well in your career. Um, I personally thought I wanted to be a tech writer, so I got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in communication. I did tech writing, then I pivoted into technical business development. Then I decided I wanted to be a systems engineer at the time, so I went back and did another master's in systems engineering. I'm not saying everyone needs to go out and get three degrees, especially in Web3, that's very much not needed, but I did. that was my pathway in, in a Web2 environment where those credentials were required for success in a role or even to be considered for an engineering role. And so for me, that meant I was in school for, you know, seven years, something like that. And I worked full time during that period of time as well. So it required a lot of sacrifice, um, you know, not spending as much time with my spouse as I might have wanted to at times, not being able to go out and hang out with friends, having to sacrifice other things I loved in my life to achieve these goals. Uh, so that was definitely something that required an enormous lift on my end, but I knew One day I would wake up and be done with all of that schooling and I would be able to pursue the career that I really wanted and that it would pay off. And I would say, keep your eye on your long-term goal and make short-term sacrifices to achieve it uh, and really boost your own confidence and knowledge in whatever technical discipline you're interested in. Um, and then you can establish yourself through public speaking events, taking interviews like this as a, an expert in your field, and that will not only allow others to acknowledge your skill set and that you are an expert, but it boosts your own confidence as well. I think feeling, um, you know, maybe feeling like you have a little bit of imposter syndrome is, is normal for a lot of women. Uh, I've suffered from that myself and it's really a confidence issue and it's okay to feel that way. But if you put yourself out there um, and continue learning and deepening your technical skills, that helps you move past the, those feelings. It is amazing like how you are giving advice without 
actually given it like you're inspiring me so much because you know like do this schooling maybe can be hard and maybe like some of us uh, give up easily because we don't think that we're going to get there but what you're saying about the imposter syndrome and what we put ourselves like a lot of pressure I think is something that really like levels up the experience that you have in order for us to like okay if she could do it we can also so that's amazing thank you so much for yeah. telling I us think this of course yeah I think anyone's capable of it it's just it does require sacrifice and hard work I think one a great piece of advice that uh, another woman gave to me is you know if you think you want to become an engineer, would you wake up in two years or five years and regret not making that happen? Because if you go and start, you know, go through a coding boot camp, for example, if that takes you a year to get through, the advice I was given is do those hard things for future you. So when I thought of going back to school, I dreaded it. It sounds getting a, a master's degree in, in engineering feels like this insurmountable, like just a crazy goal. And I thought to myself, okay, would future Mickey be mad at me for not having done the work now? And so I thought, you know, future Mickey will be able to, you know, stop work at 6 p.m. and get dinner with, you know, her spouse and be able to take her dog around the block on walks and not have to micromanage every minute of her time. But current Mickey is not going to be able to do those things. So she can enable future Mickey to do those things. Okay. So future Mickey is now at the top of the mountain. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that. But, um, uh, I want to go like now to hear about your experience at Edge and Note. Like, I think everyone wants to know about the culture. Like, how is it working at Edge and Note? And if you can tell us a little bit about your experience so far. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say in engineering, I mentioned um, there's just me and one individual contributor who are women, but there are a lot of other women at the company. We have several uh, women who are executive assistants, are um, on the marketing team as well. Our CEO is a woman um, now, so that I feel like now that we have this really core group of women and we're able to support each other, we formed a little group called Flamingals. Our edge node mascot is a flamingo. And so the Flamingals is our, our group to uh, share insight, share our shared experiences with each other um, and, and chat about just fun stuff and, and bond in that way. Um, and again, the men that I work with are all so amazing and really incredible partners and really genuinely care about seeing women succeed as well. Um, and we have all, all sorts of, you know, women at the company, people with different backgrounds and skill sets and strengths and superpowers. And I think all of the men are super excited and are there to cheer us on and they want to see us succeed as well. Oh, oh my God. I really want to work there. <laughs> it sounds like the best place to work. <laughs> so uh, what distinctive qualities make Edge and Node an exciting and innovative workplace? Because we know that it is an exciting workplace, but in these particularly leading security uh, SREs and tech support teams, like how do you foster a supportive team culture that encourages collaboration and growth and innovation? Yeah, I think for, for my team specifically, we have regular stand-ups. I think it's important, you know, in a fully uh, virtual work environment to have some kind of stable routine where you can see each other in synchronous meetings over Zoom. Um, and at the start of those stand-ups, we don't jump right into looking at our tasks on, on our board. We start by having chit-chat. So for example, in the our Monday stand-ups, we talk about what we did over the weekend. And I think just establishing that caring culture um, really shows that people are valued for who they are and, and what's going on outside of work as well, and not just executing tasks. Um, and it feels very much like, you know, a family in that way. Um, and people, I would say, like at Edge Node, everyone is there because they deeply and genuinely care about this mission that we're on um, to promote and enable blockchain indexing in a decentralized way. And we are all extremely values and mission aligned, not just on my team, but across the entire company. And I think that's one of the things that makes it an incredible workplace. Amazing. So do you have like any team building like activities or something that you foster every, like, I don't know, now and then to like get together or I don't know, to like 
forget about the the work and just like build a a family or a team yeah so uh within my specific team we do have a shared signal chat um where you know one of our uh team members is on vacation right now he's posting videos of goats that he saw on vacation and that's just like a fun way to to share kind of what we're up to with each other as a company though edge and node and all of the core development companies within the graph ecosystem we do regular retreats so we do get together at a minimum once a year um our last one was in panama city the one before that was in lake como in italy and we have a number of really incredible, deeply technical uh, discussions lined up during those retreats. But we also do, our design team uh, does these team building events where they'll give us like a Lego challenge mm -hmm. or other challenges, you know, building things with sticks and paper. And <laughs> it's a really fun way to bond with each other. Um, and then beyond that as well, um, you know, the graph as a whole, we represent um, our ecosystem at a lot of hackathons and other events. And those are another other great opportunities to see each other in person. And of course, anytime we do that, we uh, will go out and, you know, get a beer, or get dinner, or get coffee together and, and make sure we have time to bond during those in-person events as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've saw that the Edge and Node team like are very like unique. They are always like very friendly, very kind. So I think like it's part of their culture to be also that type of people. So um, I think that now we can like get to the advice type of part where I want like to ask if you want to give any advice to young girls or maybe that are women out there that are watching this episode and want to know how to pursue a technology career here in Web3. Like what can you give that, that advice? Like what do you suggest them to do first to be part of this world? Yeah, I think joining Web3 in general is so much eas easier in some regards than Web2 because I mentioned, you know, the job requirements are much more flexible in Web3, but there are also so many ways to contribute to a protocol uh, in Web3. You can in, you could apply for jobs, for example, Edge and Notice hiring. You could certainly apply for a job at, let's say you wanted to join the graph ecosystem, you could apply for jobs at, at Edge and Note or any of the core development companies. But in Web3, you also have DAOs, right? There are DAOs that have paid um, opportunities. So if you apply to join a DAO, um, you can earn often bounties that they give for, for example, providing tech support, or um, in the case of the graph, um, you would earn a bounty for migrating subgraphs off of the hosted service onto the decentralized network. And so there are cool opportunities like that that are very unique in Web3 to earn money without being an employee of a, a company. Um, and I think just thinking, you know, beyond just regular jobs, like look at what DAOs exist and see if those speak to your interests and your skill sets and apply for grants through the DAO. And you can be a very successful independent contractor in this space and making those connections is critical. You can also just straight up go to hackathons, fly yourself all over the place, go to hackathons. Um, and if you have strong skills, you can potentially win bounties that different protocols offer at those hackathons, the graph of course, pays out bounties for, for building on the graph at, at different events. Um, that's another great way to, to earn money and make connections in this space. Um, I personally, uh, if anyone reaches out to me on LinkedIn, I will always respond if you are seeking mentorship or advice. I, I will always give that freely. Um, I'll send you my Calendly and you can set up 15 or 30 minutes and I'll offer you know free advice to anyone who needs it. A lot of other leaders in this space will do that. Our CEO, Tegan, does that as well through her website. So I think just reaching out, don't be afraid to reach out. Um, if you're very early on in your career, maybe you're still in high school even, I would say uh, start reaching out, do like cold call reach outs on, on LinkedIn or um, at events. If you go to your first hackathon, stop by the booths, get to understand who's staffing the booths, get their contact information, their telegram handle or signal handle form connections, and then you can get to understand what jobs exist. What Do you want to be a front-end engineer? Um, do you want to be a Rust developer? And then you can find a good mentor in one of those fields and, and go from there. That's great advice that you're saying, because I think that we are afraid like to reach out, but I think in this Web3 world, you have to just put yourself out there and 
do it. So it's very kind of you that you like offer your contact and your DMs on LinkedIn for the girls to just um, talk to you about what they want to like ask. So we're going to leave your socials on our description box in this YouTube episode. And now I want to ask you uh, a final question that is about how do you do it? Like, how do you balance your work and life like in every single way? Because I know that being a leader or being a manager requires a lot of time, but also like you are a spouse, as you were saying. So how do you balance all of these things? Like, how do you do it? Like, are you a superwoman? Yeah. <laughs> no, and I think I, I fail consistently in, in, in establishing that balance perfectly. I think there, you know, there's different seasons in life and there are seasons where, you know, the company requires a lot from you. And there are times where you're able to, take a breath and step back and, and, you know, prioritize your, your health and wellness. Edgenode specifically as a company uh, definitely enables our, our people to achieve a healthier work-life balance. Um, we do nearly quarterly weeks off. Um, so for a week in December, a week at the end of March and a week in July, we give our, our team members the whole week off to rest and recharge We do have an unlimited slash flexible PTO policy where if you have surgery or you're burnt out and need time off, um, you can take it. You let your manager know and and take the time you need. Um, I think for me, you know, there are I think I've just embraced uh, shifting away from a mindset where I start work at a certain time and I end work at a certain time. And for me, what's helped me be a better leader, more present for my people and more present for my spouse is to wake up early and I'll check in on Slack or Discord, respond to a bunch of messages, and then I'll leave my phone and go get ready for my work day. I'll get dressed, you know, do my hair and makeup, for example, eat breakfast and then go to my computer and then I'm working again. And then in the middle of the day, I'll take a break sometimes and go on a run. And then I come back and I do more work and more meetings. And then I'm able to stop and have dinner with my husband. And then maybe I just check Discord to make sure nothing's on fire before I go to sleep. And I think that for me is much healthier in being present and available for work. And then also able to do the things that uh, promote a healthy, you know, healthy mental health and healthy physical health outside of work. Edgenote enables people to, we give a lot of autonomy and trust to our, our folks. I don't care when and when you're working, where you're working from, as long as you're getting the job done. Um, I want you to be able to do that in a way that works best for you and then also be present for the people you love outside of work. Um, and so I try to model that as best I can. I fail sometimes, um, but I do very much care about that for my people. And if we burn everyone out, then that's not good for anyone. <laughs> and so making sure that we're consistently reminding folks of the benefits that we offer Um, reminding them to take an extra day off if they need it um, and holding kind of to some degree, holding them accountable for actually doing that, I think is very important too. Um, we're all of course very passionate. So sometimes it's hard for us to unplug. And so as a leader, I encourage my, my people to take the time off that they need so they can rest and come back refreshed. Okay. So I think you're doing an amazing job in Web3. And I know for sure that this episode will get to a lot of women and girls out there that really are not sure if they want to be in this Web3 world or if they are not ready. So I think this was a great episode. So thank you so much for having this time to do it. I know that you have a very limited agenda, but I really um, am grateful. And Rastronauts is also grateful about the possibility of interviewing you. Thank you very much, Emmy. I'm so glad to meet you and to be here today. Um, yeah, and I would just say if anyone has any questions or want, you know, if anyone wants mentorship, again, my virtual door is always open. I'll also be at ETH Denver. I'm not sure when this episode is airing, but if it's before ETH Denver um, and anyone's interested in going to that event, definitely stop by the Graph booth. I will be there and would love to meet you all in person. Thank you so much. And of course, we will leave uh, your LinkedIn and maybe other socials that you give us on this episode. And also, thank you so much again. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching this episode. It was lovely to meet Mickey. And of course, don't forget that the Graphic Club podcast is all about empowering and inspiring more women into Web3. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this YouTube channel and of course to follow us on every social media account that we have. 
We have a little pop-up for you waiting on the link in the description box and I hope to see you in the next one. Have a good day and bye-bye!